I would like to welcome you back to Herp Herp Hooray, an internet broadcast where we simulcast on Buzzsprout, Twitter, Facebook, and don't forget to download us on iTunes. When I think about quality ball python morphs, one person comes to mind, Colin Weaver from ECRB, East Coast Reptile Breeders. www.ballpythonbreeder.com is our special guest this week. Colin, welcome to Herp Herp Hooray. Thanks, Mike. Glad to be here. So uh, why don't you give our listeners a little background on uh, one of the coolest combos out there, and you just happen to produce it. We're talking about the Silver Surfer Ball Python. Um, the, the Silver Surfer was an um, uh, animal that I first produced back in, I guess it was 2009, um, and it was, it was honestly just a bit of luck, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a ghost, super pastel, Lesser black pewter, so it's a ghost lesser silver streak. It's in the end, what that is. Um, but I originally produced it by breeding together a um, a pastel lesser to a silver streak. That, uh, unbeknownst to me, both of which were head ghosts, and I just randomly got lucky and actually produced you know, two silver surfers from that clutch. So it was a it was a gut shot and it was a lucky shot, but it was a <laughs> I'm certainly a welcomed lucky shot. So, so, like, what do you got planned for those guys this year? Oh, I've been, I got the, both of those males up to size quickly, so I was able to breed them in 2010. I also bred them last year, and, and you know, I bred them again this year. And um, This year I'm breeding them to, oh, gosh, to, um, what, like, a champagne pinstripe, to some clown stuff. Um, pied things, bring them into pieds, and um, gosh, who else did I breed those two? I, I, I even did a few. What's that? Well, didn't you say you noticed something about your clowns? Is that the what you're talking? Oh about? yeah, la last year, yeah. The um, I mean, when, it, when a range of pores, I mean, luck can either be really good or really bad. No, but but last year I bred the silver surfers to some just normal clown females in an effort to, to try and produce some, you know, some some cool visual stuff that was double head for ghost and clown. And um, much to my surprise, uh, when the eggs hatched, there was actually some visual clown in it. And they're, they're super reduced. And so I guess ultimately what that means is that either one or both of my silver surfer males is actually had clown. I don't know which one. I'm trying to figure that out this year. But um, so that, that also means that going back way into the original production of this, that my the original pair that just happened to be um, pet ghosts, or one of those also happened to be pet clown. And, and I still don't know whether that was the male or the female. I don't know if I'll ever know that. But um, but yeah, so I got visual clowns from that. So now I'm, you know, I'm raising up, you know, animals that are, you know, 3 or 14 visual carriers that are also a double head for ghost clown. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that stuff, and I'm, I'm really anxious to, to, you know, the males I have pretty close up to size, so I'll be able to do some stuff with them this year. Of course, the females will take longer, but um, I'm, the, the long-term prospect of producing, you know, ghost clown multi-gene combos is, is something that's very, very exciting for me. I'm really looking forward to it. You and me both. So, um, do you have any new mutations you're working with over there at ECRB? New mutations? Secret, top secret stuff you want to reveal? Um, you, you know, I'm. Uh, it's funny because people say I'm secretive, but I'm really not. Um, I, I don't have anything that's that, that's super crazy in terms of you know some unknown gene that that nobody else is you know has or anything like that. I. I, you know, I think, or like anybody else does, and then I have some animals that I'm working with. I'm trying to figure out what they are, if anything, and and, and a lot of that stuff I'm still, you know, in, in the middle in the middle part of that, where I've, I've raised up some things that were very unusual, and I produced offspring from it. And some of that offspring was unusual, but still nothing super definitive. And so, you know, now I'm in the process of just getting those animals up to size and and seeing if I can. You know, figure out whether or not genetically I have something or not. It's um, 
it's just a long process. I mean, any of that tinkering stuff, because you never know whether or not you're dealing with something that's simple recessive, or if there's going to be a, some kind of cool visual super form of, of some little weird pattern. I mean, heck, look at the yellow belly. I mean, who the thought that the super form is going to be an ivory? And so, you know, I'm right in that transitional state where basically I'm raising up you know, the, the dinker equivalent of a yellow belly, wondering what's going to happen when I bring them back to each other. Well, uh, fingers are crossed for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, like everybody else. But, you know, it's, you know, how many dinker projects are there in the world, you know, and so how many are actually paying out? So, time will tell. Time will tell. So switching up speeds here, why don't you tell us about the ever elusive uh, panda pied? Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Um, the first panda pied that Ian Nozowski produced back, what was that, 2000, I think it was in 2009 as well. Um, super cool snake. I was fortunate enough to, to get to see it and work with it a little bit in person and, 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 and take a few photos of it. And I, I know it disappeared into somebody's collection. I'm not 100 sure even who has it anymore. I, I think I know, but I'm not quite sure. And in the years that have followed, a lot of people have been trying, but to my knowledge, nobody else has hit on it. Um, I had several shots at it last year, and just missed. You know, I, I produced black pastel pies, and and you know lots of black pastels that are had pied and stuff like that. But I just you know, I missed on the the one in 16 odds. So, you know, I'm still doing. You know, black vest still had pie, the black vest still had pie, like a lot of other people are. Um, even this current breeding season, that's what I'm doing. I, do, I have more females contributed to it. I'm up, up more hold back. Small army. Yeah, I built up a small army of black vest still had pie females. Um, but um, I believe that that particular combo, once we're able to finally start producing it in larger quantities, is, is going to be just a, a fantastic, fantastic animal to, to go into people's collection. I mean, who doesn't want a black and white snake? I mean, you know, whether they're a truckload of dollars to buy or they're you know the, the same price as a you know an albino is today, they're always going to be a popular snake. So I'm, I think it's a really cool and good project to to be in, and, and that's why I've been focused on it for quite a while now. Awesome, but but uh, how's your season going? My season's late. Uh, which is normal for me. Um, you know, it's, it, this is always a, a really kind of frustrating time of year for me because I see everybody else getting clutches of eggs and hatching stuff out, and I'm still you know, basically in the waiting for egg phase. So I really don't get the bulk of my my egg laying until the, much later in the year, and um, it just my cycle just runs several months different than, than a lot of other breeders do. But things are going well. Um, I'm actually still pairing males and females together. Um, I have several females that have, that have ovulated and are crabbed. Um, so now I'm just, just kind of sitting back and beginning to wind down and, and wait for the egg laying part of the season. But things are good. Awesome. Good to hear. So uh, tell us some of the cool things you held back last year. What did I hold back last year? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, Go into detail, please. <laughs> I held back a, a lot of stuff that, that I, I probably have produced before, but, I, but I'm looking to build up quantity of them. Um, uh, for somehow, I don't even know how I did it, but I managed to have ghost in almost everything. And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of anything that's ghost or hypo, um, as well as anything that's yellow belly. Um, I'm just a freak for anything that's yellow belly. And so... I last year I held back a lot of like um, um, yellow belly silver streaks and yellow belly black pewters and and um, things that are just multi gene yellow belly animals that that I can raise up and do cool things with. I'm particularly working toward putting those combos into you know all the different super stripe variations, which is what my primary motivation is, and into you know the, the puma stuff as well. Um, and then I also held back a lot of. Uh, ghost combos like you know, uh, you know, ghost silver streak and then ghost lesser black pewter and ghost super pastel lessers and, and and things of that nature. I held back quite a bit of that stuff too. Um, and I think that was primarily it. I'm, I'm I'm trying to get better about not holding so much stuff back. So I'm, I'm, it seems like every year I want to hold back everything. Then as it gets bigger, I'm like, oh, I got to keep that. Oh, I got to keep that. 
And they're like, no, 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 I can't keep everything. But that's the hard part of letting them about Python business. That's the fun part, too. Yeah. But no, we've uh, had to pry animals from your hands that you just wanted to keep, so <laughs> we appreciate that. So uh, what do you think the next uh, project you'll be adding to the ECRB arsenal? You know, if, if I sat back and looked at it this year and, and asked myself, what, what was I going to add? Something that I'm that I know I'm not going to produce and I want to add it would be like a, um, a first and foremost like a, some multi gene male stuff that are all genes that I don't have in, in large quantity in my collection so like a you know an inchy fire you know vanilla or something like that yeah you know, I'd be looking for mm -hmm. for males that are you know multiple gene stuff. Um, like a lot of people, I still don't have any any real interest in messing around with with a bunch of desert stuff. So I, I'm not looking to add any of that until we further resolve exactly what's going on there. But um, and and then if I would just see some some other cool kind of projects come along, I I, I don't know if there's a specific specific single gene morph that I can say that I would then I'm really looking to add into my collection, um, but more multi-gene carrying animals that really complement nicely the things that I already have. Nice. So if you're like me, I like to think about what I should have done. So what project do you wish you'd gotten into sooner? Um, I should have gotten, from a, from a simple perspective, I should have gotten uh, inchy stuff sooner. Same here. I like a lot of... A lot of other people, um, and I got to be honest, man. I just I kind of overlooked inches back in the you know, you know, mid two thousands and stuff. I I looked at them and I was kind of like, yeah, you yeah, know, they're interesting, but not super impressive. And, and now that we're starting to see all these really cool multi gene combos coming from, um, I, I really wish I paid closer attention to what the potential was there. So I I just missed the ball on it, man. I I I, I screwed up and, and didn't invest in it when I when I could have or should have. And now, like a lot of other people, I'm kind of playing catch up. Um, I think Oz has done some um, amazing stuff with um, with his Orange Dream project. Oh yeah, and I think there's some really cool things coming out of that. So I'd, I'd like to start working some Orange Dream stuff into um, some of the animals that I have. So that one, I, I, I'm not gonna say I missed the boat on that one because, but even though it's been around for a while, but um, but, but definitely Inchy I messed up on and, and really should have added that in early on, and. Um, what else? If there's any kind of glaring ones out there, I know for us another one is uh, vanilla. Yeah, the, I like the vanilla combos. Yeah, the combos yeah. exactly. Just a regular vanilla is such an uninspiring animal compared to the combos that it produces. That it makes sense that a lot of us missed on it. You know, it. You know, I just every time I look at a regular vanilla, I'm like, eh, you know. I can see why I didn't want to invest money in it back when. But yeah, some of these, you know, vanilla creams and things like that. I, uh, the black pastel vanilla cream, I recall seeing a picture of a couple months back. It's a phenomenal snake. Absolutely gorgeous. And so, you know, again, there's, it's just one of those ones where you're like, oh, wish I had been paying attention. Um, and the other one, even though I'm pretty significantly invested in it now, you know, the, all the Super Stripe stuff, I think just has just tremendous potential, and I, I definitely didn't miss the boat on that because I'm I'm pretty heavily into it, but um, I I do wish I had gotten into it even even earlier than I had done. So and I, I think that there's a there's a great opportunity there for some really just spectacular combinations. I think and you're Mark right. Yeah. Mark Haas is some really cool stuff, and so you know. I'm looking forward to see what the long-term prospects are in that particular project. Me too. So uh, have you seen the disco cream? Uh, you know, I think I that, have. That's right. Disco cream, I, I, I feel like I've seen a picture of it. So. Yeah, that's pretty gnarly. Sounds like another gene I'm looking at, like, ooh, disco. Now there's a lot of um, 
I haven't been following the, all the, the gory details of that particular snake, but, mm-hmm. but yeah, and again, I've, I've seen the discos and super discos and, and all those other things, and I'm just like, um, you know, again, it's another one where I'm like, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to you know, go all in on that one. There's, for, I'm not interested as a breeder in, in, in having everything. You know, I'm, I'd much more, I'd, I'd much rather focus on having, you know, you know several really kind of choice products and projects and really work those rather than trying to have a little bit of everything. I think you get too spread out. And then the, the worst thing, too, is you end up keeping it all. You know, if I, if I only <laughs> have, you know, one disco this and one inchy that and one vanilla whatever, then, you know, when I produce clutches and I produce a, only a very few number of clutches, then the really cool stuff that comes out, I end up keeping it. And, you know, I, I, I love this stuff as much as the next breeder, but it, when it push comes to shove, it, you know, I need to sell snakes in order to facilitate being able to continue to do this. And if I keep everything, then that's not really something I can be doing. Well, that's where we're at. We're, we're keeping everything cool, <laughs> as I'm sure you did back in the day. Oh, yeah. I still do it, so I can't take my own advice. You're your best customer, you always say, right? No doubt. So uh, I have to say, me and Christina, we really love your blog, so we look forward to your witty angles on things. So why don't you tell us the people, uh, the listeners, a little bit about your blog? Um, my blog is just something I do on my website that just, I mean, I guess like most blogs, it gives me a chance to just kind of say what's on my mind. And I, I don't have a, you know, a specific, you know, agenda or thing that I want to write about. But usually what will happen is, is I'll, I'll be in a conversation with somebody or, or read something, and and it just kind of sparks off an idea that, that sends me off on this tangent that somehow ends up being related to the reptile world. And you know, I'm, like a lot of people, I'm concerned about the, the political landscape with with reptiles, and so I, I frequently write upon that stuff where, you know, just, just my ponderings and, and perspectives on that and kind of the, the, the plight of the reptile owner, you know, being forced into animal activism and things like that. And, um, and then anything dealing with the ball python business in general, I, you know, if, I spend a lot of time and energy thinking about the economic viability of, of being a ball python breeder. And, and kind of what it takes to be financially successful in this business. You know, if it's just a hobby, we can all throw tons of money on it. You know, but if it's a business, then we have to treat it as such. And I, and I, and I try and think about that stuff, and then I just kind of share what my opinions and perspectives are on that. And so any other thing that comes along that, that I kind of think about that, that ultimately ends up being reptile-related, which for me most things end up being reptile-related, um, I'll sit down and write on them. But, you know, I don't, I don't have a specific timeline on, on when I publish blogs. I just kind of, you know, as the spirit moves me kind of thing, I just I sit down and I, and I write about it, put it out there. But, and, and I'm fortunate that, that it seems like a lot of people actually read what I write, which has always been humbling. So, but, it, but it's cool. You know, I, I, I primarily write it for me, but the, the fact that other people derive enjoyment from it is, is, is nice. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it, man. It's a, definitely a good read. So if you haven't checked out his blog yet, please do. You want to give him your blog address? It's actually just if you hit the home page of my website, if you go to ballpythonbreeder.com, um, the, the blog is on the main page, and then there's you know, links to read past articles. Awesome. I'm sure you have Twitter and uh, Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. So uh what do you think we need to do as the reptile community against all this legislation? That's a really good question, Jason. Um, I try. It, it doesn't have a simple answer. I mean, the, there's an easy thing to say, and then there's the, the reality of things. And the, the, the easy Just say thing no. To say Just is, don't know. Yeah, is, is that we all need to be better organized, in the way that the that the special interest groups that are that are against us are organized, um, the, the reality of it is that the reptile community is a is, is a disjoint community, somewhat by its very nature, 
and the diversity of the people, and whether that's diversity in personality, diversity in, 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 uh, in economics, and in, in diversity in, in political opinion, makes it very hard to really get people to either A, want to be involved, or B, able to be involved, whether that's through the, the contribution of their time or their money. Um, it's, um, it, it's, just, it's a tough, tough thing. And, and I see, in all honesty, I see a lot of just kind of apathy from the, from the average reptile keeper. And, and I suspect that that's a pretty common thing in a lot of people for, for a lot of different topics. And it, it, apathy may not even be a fair word. It's, it's that people just want to be reptile keepers and, and be left alone. And the, the notion that, that I have to get involved in, in protecting my rights just to be a, a reptile owner, is, it, it has the promise of being exhausting. And so and sure. a lot of people just don't want that. You know, they, they just want to own their snakes in, in peace and quiet and privacy. And, and you know, if, if my next door neighbor chooses to keep venomous snakes, as long as he does so in a, in a way that's not going to let him get out, I'm cool. You know, but you know, of course I'm, I'm probably unique amongst next door neighbors that, that, that feel that way. But um, the, the community needs to coalesce more so than it has. We need, you know, we need stronger, better leadership to, to go in and give us you know, a, a way to coalesce and have a, have a clear path. And we also need to stop conceding bit by bit. You know, and again, it's, it's a it's a politically charged discussion to have, but to go in and, and separate out, you know, and, and, and you know, have certain animals falling off the, the back of the wagon in terms of being the, the otherwise sacrificial lambs to, to keep the rest of the hobby in check is is not the way to do things. So it's 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 a very it's a it's a very difficult question to just give a definitive answer to, and it's and, and it has a lot of different aspects and angles to it. Well, I appreciate you talking on it. You know, uh, united we stand, divided we fall, and you know they're just trying to divide and conquer us. So, like you said, man, we just need to stand together, and uh, we won't have any problems. Oh, we're always going to have problems, but we stand a chance of surviving the problems if we don't do better as a group. Anything else on that, or you get a you want to add to the legislation? No, 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 nothing specific. I mean, I mean, if you, no. Okay, so uh, what's your uh, favorite show to vend? I know we My can get a show? couple. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite show right now is, is still the, the Hamburg Reptile Show. Um, it's probably more than anything just because it's such a it, it's such an oddity. It, it shouldn't be a great show, but it is. You know, the, the show is basically in the middle of nowhere, and you know, but the, the, I think the benefit of it is that it's it's equidistant from everywhere, and so. The show is able to pull people from from New York, you know, through Virginia, all through Pennsylvania, and you know, Jersey, and so you you get a lot of people coming from a lot of different directions, and all, every, for everybody, it's just a you know, at most, just a couple hour drive, and so it, it turns it into a, a really good show where there's just tons and tons of people, lots of vendors, you know, lots lots of cool animals. And um, you know, I, I think second on my list would be the White Plains show. And it, the only problem that I have with the White Plains show is just a heck of a lot farther for me to get to. But the, the Hamburg show, I think, is the is probably the, the, the coolest show I have right now. I, I bet you like uh, White Plains a little more in the summer, though, right? Does it get hot in Hamburg or no? Not too bad. Oh, it gets yeah, it gets crazy hot in Hamburg. And then, yeah, you know, the, I see the you with a towel there. So. <laughs> yeah, and it, it gets super hot. You know, it's and you know the, the the building's always too hot or too cold. You know, and so it, you know, again, it's not the greatest facility in the world. But again, it's it's that 
just that odd kind of thing where it just everything comes together just right for that show. And it just works out to be awesome. You know, whether you're a vendor or whether you're, you know, somebody coming to, to, to see or to buy, it's it's just a super cool show. Again, you know, White Plains is just as awesome. It's just it, it isolates a lot of people further down south. You know, people from Virginia and and the you know, Maryland oftentimes aren't gonna make the hike up to, to White Plains. But they'll they'll gladly make the hike up to the Amber. So those those two shows are very similar in terms of their quality. They just you know, one was just a little more difficult for people to get to. Right on. All right, man. So, uh, so what's hot? You know, like what's your number one seller? Like most requested ball python over there at DCRB. The, the, the animal that I get the biggest request for is yellow belly anything, particularly females. But this got yellow belly in it, and it, it's a you know multi gene animal. People want it, and. Um, and that's just because the yellow belly gene is just, and, and I'm less than humble about this, is to me the single best gene in the entire ball python trade. And for almost every other gene out there, it makes it better. And people are hip to that. You know, I've, I've often referred to the yellow belly gene as the genetic scrub brush of the, of the ball python world. You know, you put it to anything and it basically cleans it up and, and, and spits out something even more attractive. And so it's the next logical progression for so many combos. You're like, oh, sweet, I made a silver streak. Okay, well, what should I do next? Well, I'll make a silver streak yellow belly. Or, you know, oh, I've got a, you know, a, a pastel inchy butter. What should, what should I put into that? Oh, well, let's put yellow belly into it. Make it better. And then every now and then, the, the yellow belly does something crazy. You know, the, the super form of it alone is something crazy. But then you look at, you know, the Puma and the Super Stripe and, and these other combos that are out there where, you know, you put yellow belly into it and all of a sudden, bam. And so I, I think people are just real interested in that, of going in and producing these insanely beautiful, ultra-colorful animals. Um, and then every now and then also getting something crazy out of it. You know? And that's and I, and I see that in what people are asking for me. It's, it's you know, where you got this yellow belly, multi-gene stuff. Yeah, as we're talking about the yellow belly, I'm sitting here looking at the yellow belly lesser black pastel, and I remember when you posted it, I, I emailed you, man, and that thing is smoking. I can't believe the red's on that thing. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I, I still have that. So you're looking at the one I think, I think I still have that. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah the tail is really little, that red. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that little red tail, yeah. The, the, the multi-gene yellow belly stuff, they go through some pretty dramatic color changes, and not the least of which is that they just get more and more and more yellow as time goes on. Uh, but I, I, I just love the yellow belly gene. I think it's just a, an unbelievable gene, and, and having stuff that that adult multi gene yellow belly stuff, seeing how gorgeous it is. It's gorgeous when it hatches, and it's gorgeous when it's an adult. It's just I, I, I can't get enough of it. I, I want to put yellow belly into everything. I'm with you on that one, man. I'm such a subtle gene, but it does so much. It's, it's a, and to that same extent, it's you know the, the single gene yellow belly stuff is, is so undervalued. I mean, just horribly undervalued for what you can do with with the yellow belly. You know, the the, the current market for in terms of money for for yellow belly stuff is just crazy, and, and people should add as much yellow belly, just single gene female yellow belly, to their collection as they can. That they're, they're so ridiculously inexpensive compared to what they should be. So, and you know, and I think like a lot of other breeders, you know, I have, you know, basically an army of, of yellow bellies and ivories and, and things like that for that specific reason. Is that they're a very economical way to to, to produce amazing things. And, and to say there's a synergy in their value when you start producing multi-gene combos that are yellow belly is, is, is an understatement. You know, you breed a pastel lesser to a yellow belly, and you know the stuff you produce is not only gorgeous but also you know, worth good money. Hold backs. <laughs> <laughs> no, sell it. <laughs> so, uh, are you going to be vending any new shows here, as of new? Um, I believe I'm vending at the the Route Ten Reptile Expo, which is a 
kind of a new startup show that's over here in Virginia, in the central part of Virginia. That show is on the 15th of July. Um, so I've, I've never been to that show before, so I'm not sure what to expect. But um, you know, Troy Thomas and some other guys that I know are, are putting it together. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it take off because I think the area could benefit from, a, from another show. There's a lot of reptile people in Virginia. Uh, it's, it's amazing how, the, how many of them there are in the, in the Virginia area. And um, so I got that show, and then I'll be at um, it'll be at Hamburg again. I don't know what the exact date is. I have to look at my calendar. And then the other show that I'm excited about is the this is the second year of the Myrtle Beach show. That's in August, the, the middle part of August. That's a two day show that's down in Myrtle Beach. And that show, I'm, I think that show is poised to be kind of the, the next big show. And the, the, the timing of it may have to get worked out in terms of people production being on the ground. But, um, it, you know, last year it pulled in all the big name breeders and this year it's doing it again. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, one, I look forward to going down there because, you know, the, the who's who of ball pythons is there. So you get to see some of the, the crazy stuff people have produced. And I'm also looking forward to, 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 to kind of take off and be a, another good show. You know, it's, you know, Florida has basically, through their, you know, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, or whatever they call it down there, is, you know, kind of really clearly to, to breeders like me sent the message that that they're not interested in us being there. So going to Daytona holds absolutely no interest to in me. You know, I you know I know it's, it has been for a long time that the, the show shows, but it, it, as far as I'm concerned, I'm done with Daytona and, and never even wanting to bother trying to bend down there. You know, it's I, I know there's good money to be made, but if you just if they continue to make it so much more difficult. Then they can have it, and I'll just let Myrtle Beach and other shows be the be the replacement for them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the Myrtle Beach show this year. Have you ever considered uh, Tinley Park, Chicago? I have I consider it every year? The problem is, is it's like a almost a 15 hour drive for me, and so the chances of me packing up all my animals to drive them that far and then back again. I, I, the only thing I hate about shows, Jason, is is the stress that it puts on my animals. And you know, for that reason, I'm not looking to you know to go to California and do shows or Texas and do shows. And, and, and Tenley kind of falls right in there. I, I think it'd be a great show for me, but um, I, I just don't know that I'm really ready to to, to do something that, 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 that big of a hike. And, and, and ultimately, I know I should, and I probably will end up doing it, but right now, that's kind of my opinion on it. Sounds like you need a uh, co-pilot on that on that trip. Yeah, oh, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah, and I could ship all my animals, you know, air. Yeah, I was going to say that. Then it gets to be cost prohibitive, so. Mm-hmm. Then if something happen, should ever happen, oh, you know, you didn't have control of it, you know? Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Mm -hmm. No. Um, no, I think you hit on a lot of good points. I mean, it's, I could talk all day, but um, I'll spare you. <laughs> well, you're not sparing us anything. So we are talking to Colin Weaver from ECRB, East Coast Reptile Breeders, www.ballpythonbreeder.com. Is there any other uh, contacts you'd like to give out? Or is that, is that sufficient that you could be able to get a hold of you that way? Uh, everything that I do, you can find me find me there. Um, that, that's probably the best way to get in touch with me here to, to see what I got going on. So, you know, I, I do Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that, but they're not nearly as, as active as, as other people are. Well, Colin, again, thank you for coming on Her Per Parade and making the show a success. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, her per parade out.